Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining our webinar, 10 Common Posting Compliance Mistakes to Avoid. A quick note before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature on your screen. We will respond immediately to any technical concerns, and any other questions you have about the information being presented will be answered as soon as possible after the presentation. And without further ado, here is Ashley Kaplan, our in-house Senior Employment Law Attorney. Ashley has been practicing labor and employment law for more than 19 years. Here at GNEAL, Ashley handles our legal compliance and also oversees the teams responsible for researching all the posting laws and developing poster guard services to meet our customers' diverse needs. Ashley has agreed to follow up with a response to any posting compliance questions you submit during the presentation. And as a special offer to our attendees today, she will also be available to provide a complimentary consultation about your specific posting compliance needs. If you're interested, please indicate that in the question box, and we will contact you to set it up. And now, here's our presenter, Ashley Kaplan. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. The goal of today's webinar is to share some important information about labor law posting compliance, the risks of noncompliance, and why it's important to get it right. We get questions a lot about the penalties for being out of compliance. What can really happen if you're missing a poster? So we're going to go over what can happen and what is actually happening out there in terms of fines, penalties, and lawsuits. And that's something a lot of people don't even realize. It's not just government posting fines that you need to be aware of. Employee lawsuits are the real danger, and labor law posting compliance can have a direct impact on your liability in any kind of employee dispute or litigation. We're also going to cover what posting compliance really means. It's not just a matter of having the most recent posters up on the wall. There's a lot to know when it comes to things like the format of the posters, how and where to post, especially if you have a large facility where you potentially need to post in several locations to cover your obligations. Um, and also what you need to do to, to cover your off-site workers, your uh, remote workers or your telecommuters. We're also going to talk about common problems with the content of the posters. There may be posting requirements that apply to you that you're not even aware of. And most employers, whether you're handling posting compliance yourself in-house or using another poster provider, most employers are not even aware that they're missing a lot of mandatory posters that are required for compliance. Um, for example, this could include mandatory posters that have to be posted in Spanish, even if you have no Spanish-speaking employees. Um, it could also include city or county posters, e-verify posters, posters for job applicants or applicant areas, um, and there could also be additional posters required for, depending on your industry um, or if you're a government contractor. So today we're going to go over everything you need to know to make sure your labor law postings are complete and fully compliant. Um, we'll actually highlight 10 common compliance mistakes, and we will explain why it matters, the penalties, liability, and risks associated with noncompliance. We're also going to go over a solution by PosterGuard that will help you manage all of the posting requirements that apply to your business and keep you on the right side of the law when it comes to labor law posting compliance. So hopefully you can cross posters off your list of worries and focus on other essential areas of HR, compliance, and managing your workforce. So first let's start with a basic understanding of the federal and state um, posting requirements. And then we'll go into the details about what it takes to be in full compliance and why it matters. Today's posting compliance environment is more complex than ever. As most of you probably already know, all businesses in the United States have to post both federal and state employee notices. And depending on what state you're in, this can add up to 20 individual postings that have to be displayed on your wall. Um, this includes six mandatory posters on a federal level and then up to 14 additional posters for state law compliance. Um, this slide shows the list of the federal posters, the six federal posters. Um, there's the EEOC posting, the Fair Labor Standards Act posting, OSHA, the EPPA posting, 
uh, and that stands for the Employee Polygraph Protection Act. And um, yes, this is mandatory even if you don't use lie detector tests in your business. We get that question a lot. It is uh, mandatory for everyone. And then there's the FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act posting, and the USERA posting, which stands for the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. Then on a state level, there are additional mandatory postings that are required for every business. And like I said, depending on what state you're in, this can add up to 14 additional posters. Um, this area of compliance is becoming more complex and difficult to manage over the years because more and more laws are being passed on a state level, giving employees protection in employment. And with each new law, there's a potential poster update or in some cases a brand new poster being issued. So, you know, adding to the total number of posters that you have to display. Um, the state posters cover topics such as uh, state minimum wage rates, fair employment, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, rules around smoking in the workplace, paid sick leave, child labor. Um, and then there's some new areas we're seeing like human trafficking. Um, expanded family care rights, and even um, electronic cigarettes in the workplace. On top of this, if you operate in certain cities or counties, you could have up to seven additional postings to display at each location. And then there are other specialty postings that might apply. For example, if you have government contracts, or if you're in certain highly regulated industries like healthcare or food service. So we're going to briefly touch on all of these additional requirements later in the presentation. Um, but another thing that a lot of people aren't so familiar with is that there is not a one-stop shop for free government posters. Um, while the various agencies do provide the posters, there's not a central place where you can get all the posters you need. Um, you know, you can't get them all in one place. So it actually takes quite a bit of know-how and resources to get everything you need just for your basic federal and state compliance. It's one thing if you just have one location to worry about in one state, but for multi-site employers, there's actually across the nation, there are more than 370 different posters that are required on a combined federal and state level. And these posters are issued by about 175 different agencies. So in any given state, just one state alone, managing posting compliance um, could mean having to go to up to nine different agencies just to get your required federal and state posters. Um, and for the most part, these agencies work independently. They don't have work share agreements where they provide all the posters that the sister agencies require. Um, in some cases, there are some agencies that do a pretty good job of this. They try to help out and you can get some crossover where one agency will have posters that are governed or enforced by another agency. But it's not a complete list and there is not a one-stop shop where you can get all the federal and all the state posters from all the different agencies um, that you would need for full compliance. Um, another layer adding to the complexity of posting compliance is keeping up with the rapid rate of change. And that is um, when the government issues new or updated posters and the old ones have to be changed out immediately to maintain um, your ongoing compliance. Um, the labor law posting requirements change frequently. They change all the time. And we've um, actually seen the rate of change increase to an all-time high over the past few years. Um, our legal team here at Genial monitors and tracks all of the poster changes on a daily basis. And on average, we see about 150 state posting changes a year. And every time there's a posting change, the legal team reviews the underlying laws and the poster itself to determine if it's a mandatory or a non-mandatory change. And at least half of the changes do require a mandatory update or an immediate replacement of the poster. So that's about 75 mandatory changes a year um, on a state level nationwide. Um, and just in a single state, we've seen up to six changes in one year. Um, and um, we're just keep in mind that this is just your basic federal and state posters that we're talking about. We haven't even gone into the extra posters that you may need for city and county compliance, industry specific, or um, the postings required for government contractors. We're going to get into that in a moment.
Um, another problem adding to the complexity of posting compliance is that the government agencies don't notify businesses when these posting changes occur. So this can be really difficult because the posting requirements and the notice of changes can be buried on different agency website pages. A lot of times the old posters remain up on active website links with no information, even though they're non-compliant. And sometimes the posting guidelines can be buried. They can be um, in statutes, regulations, or case law. They're not always um, in the same location where you find the um, posters to download. So this makes it difficult to find posting changes, uh, difficult to interpret whether the updates are mandatory or non-mandatory, and in some cases difficult to determine whether there are compliance deadlines for replacing old posters with new ones. That's not always announced and it's not always the same date as the effective date of the law addressed in the poster. Sometimes the poster has to go up before or after um, the actual effective date of the law. So this is just a visual of the rate of federal and state posting changes for each state. Um, this is something we update at the end of every calendar year. And it shows how many poster changes employers have had to manage for each state during this time period. So you can see the states that are in red. Um, these are the states with the most extreme level of change. And they experience between 9 and 20 posting changes during this time period. Um, and again, we're just, right now we're just talking about mandatory changes that require poster replacements. Um, the states that are highlighted in orange had a high level of change with um, anywhere from six to eight mandatory changes during this time period. The ones in yellow had three to five mandatory changes. And then there are a few states in blue, and those only had one to two poster changes. This chart um, goes state by state. And in the first column, it shows you how many posters, uh, I'm sorry, how many individual postings are required, um, including your federal and your state postings for each state. And then in the second column on the right, it shows you how many different agencies are responsible for issuing those postings. Um, this is just a good a quick self-audit tool. Um, so just at a glance, you can see how many posters are, you're required to have up on the wall. So as you can see, um, the numbers range from 9 to 20 mandatory posters per state. And then um, the column to the right shows the, the number of agencies. And you can see in a lot of cases, it could be seven, eight, or nine different agencies that you would have to contact um, in each state to get the mandatory posters. Um, now we're going to talk about the risks of noncompliance and why it's so important to make sure you have all the current postings and your posting display sites are complete and up to date. In the statutes for the regular federal postings that we went over, the government is authorized to fine up to $17,000 per location for posting violations. And that could be for missing posters or outdated posters. Um, and then on the state level, the fines are typically between $100, um, anywhere from $100 to $1,000 per violation. Um, for the city and county posters, the fines are typically in the same range as the state poster fines, anywhere from $100 to $1,000 per violation. But um, keep in mind that each posting law, uh, both uh, you know, city, state, and also federal, each posting law has its own fines attached to it, so they're really all over the place. Um, that's why we're you know, just giving you a range. Um, when it comes to government fines, there are a few states where we've seen heightened enforcement lately. So this is just something to be aware of. Um, Mostly we've seen it up in the, the northeast region of the United States. We've seen um, some heightened activity in New York and New Jersey. We've also seen some businesses getting fined um, more recently in Florida, California, and Illinois. Uh, that's not to say that it's quiet in the other states, um, but typically government posting fines come along with other violations that are being investigated. Um, the ones I just mentioned, we've actually seen um, you know, a sweep where the businesses are just being fined for posters. But typically, the government posting fines come along with some other type of um, violation that's being investigated. And the agencies are typically there because of a complaint. Um, it could be by a disgruntled employee or a former employee. It could be for anything from uh, you know, alleged safety violations, discrimination, or more commonly, it could be a complaint someone made to the Department of Labor for unpaid wages, overtime violations, or some kind of time and pay issue. 
In a few cases, like I said, we have seen employers getting fined just for the posters. And this is true especially in the retail environment and um, also for restaurants where the state attorney general can do a sweep um, checking posters on a lot of businesses at the same time, either in a shopping mall or a strip mall or some kind of retail environment. So the government posting fines can really add up, especially if you have multiple posting locations. But the biggest danger with posting violations is related to employee lawsuits. And there are a few different ways that posting compliance comes into play with employee lawsuits. The first and probably the most significant is when it comes to the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations can be an employer's best friend because it's the defense that allows you to have a claim stricken or dismissed because it was filed too late. So for example, the statute of limitations for a federal discrimination case is 300 days. For a Fair Labor Standards Act case for you know, overtime or minimum wage, the statute of limitations is two years. So typically, if you get a claim from a former employee or an existing employee for a violation and it occurred outside of that time period, you can move to have that claim dismissed and avoid all the legal fees and potential liability for the claims in the lawsuit. However, if you have a posting violation, courts have begun to publish more and more decisions saying that if an employee didn't have notice of his or her rights because the poster wasn't up or because the wrong content was up, that the statute of limitations is extended or told and you cannot use it as a defense in your lawsuit. So we've seen cases where normally an old claim could have been dismissed where the court allowed the plaintiff to pursue the claim and it ended up in a six-figure judgment just because the posters were not up on the wall. The statute of limitations not only limits the time period when someone can sue you, it also limits your exposure to damages. Um, you know, it sets the window for the, the damage period that you could be on the hook for. Um, like how many years you would have to go back to pay for a back pay award. And this would be a big problem in any case where you're facing potential damages for back pay, uh, where an employee's claim includes damages for lost wages going back in time. And this is common in lawsuits alleging wrongful termination, unfair pay practices, uh, whether it's brought under Title VII for discrimination, the Fair Labor Standards Act for time and pay violations, the Equal Pay Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the FMLA, or really just about any federal or state employment law that gives employees the right to sue in civil court. Back pay is, is um, a common remedy under any state or federal employment law. So take, for example, a case brought under the Fair Labor Standards Act for overtime pay. If you consider all of the employees affected by an overtime policy or a misclassification of a certain job position, if you, you know, misclassified a position as salaried and it should have been hourly, um, it can make all the difference in the world to cut off your back pay exposure to two years. If you don't have the statute of limitations on your side, you could be on the hook going back for years and years with liability for every employee in that particular job position um, that, that were misclassified or every hourly employee that was paid incorrectly under a faulty overtime policy. And that can really add up quickly. Um, and obviously, posting compliance is worth the effort when you consider this level of risk especially given the growing number of employment lawsuits we're seeing every year. Um, last year alone, lawsuits alleging violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act reached an all-time high and actually produced more rulings in federal court than any other type of workplace class action. Um, the most litigious states last year, and this um, is a, you know, a trend that continued over several years, the most litigious states um, were California, Florida, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And um, there's a, a recent report that shows that employers last year paid out over $250 million in judgments as a result of private lawsuits brought under the FLSA. And um, of course that doesn't include all the cases that were settled um, you know, prior to um, going to trial or the cases that were brought by the Department of Labor. Those are just private lawsuits that actually resulted in judgments. Um, discrimination lawsuits are also on the rise. 
based on my experience defending this type of litigation, discrimination claims, I can tell you that attorney's fees alone are really costly um, just to defend these kinds of claims, and that's even if you ultimately prevail on the merits of the case. So that's why the statute of limitations defense is so important. Employers spend literally thousands of dollars just defending a claim even if there's no legal validity to the allegations. A recent report um, shows that in a typical discrimination case, an employer spends an average of about $250,000 in attorney's fees alone um, if the case goes to trial. And of course, I've seen um, cases where it's a lot higher than that as well. Um, and you know, remember, in addition to the attorney's fees, the employer also faces potential liability for the alleged violations and could end up paying millions to satisfy a legal judgment for a claim that never should have been brought if they had been able to assert the statute of limitations defense. So it's really critical. Um, there are a lot of published cases where this has occurred, and we actually have a detailed white paper with um, some examples and more information about the, um, the uh, cases and the consequences for uh, failing to post and what can happen when the statute of limitations defense is waived. So if you're interested in um, getting more information about this, we'll be happy to send you the white paper. Just use the um, questions uh, feature on your screen or you could just send us an email and we'll follow up with you after the presentation. Um, another way that posting compliance comes into play with employee lawsuits is as evidence of bad faith. And all of the different federal employment laws um, and state employment laws as well, um, they all have different standards where the concept of good faith or bad faith affects the employer's potential liability. Like under Title VII for discrimination claims, you can be assessed punitive damages. Under the FMLA and the FLSA, you can be assessed double damages or what are also called liquidated damages. And depending on the law that's at issue, Courts look at various factors to determine if a company acted in bad faith or good faith. Um, for example, whether you had written policies in place, whether you trained your managers on compliance issues and you know, how thorough and how frequent your um, training sessions were, um, what steps you took to prevent and respond to violations. Um, and now we're seeing more and more cases where posting compliance is coming in as a common factor that the courts are looking at when making these assessments. Um, also, when it comes to the FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, the most recent regulations actually mention posting compliance as a recognized cause of action if it results in an interference with someone's rights. So failure to post the required FMLA notices, if they result in some kind of injury or harm to an employee, for example, if an employee didn't have the right information to know how long they had for leave or what the procedures were for requesting time off, um, and that was caused by the absence of the posting, then the employer can be on the hook for that employee's back pay and all the other damages suffered by that employee under the FMLA. So if the employee ends up getting terminated, that could mean back pay, front pay, reinstatement, and so on. Um, by the way, the white paper that I mentioned also has examples of these kinds of cases. Um, there are um, illustrations of the, the bad faith concept and also FMLA uh, violations based on failure to post. So needless to say, it's important to make sure you're on the right side of the law when it comes to posting compliance. And it is simply not worth the risk to cut corners knowing the risk and the potential liability that's involved. Um, now we're going to talk about what it takes to be in compliance. And in addition to keeping track of all the changes and staying current, there are other aspects of posting compliance that you need to be aware of. So we're going to highlight the most common mistakes, um, 10 of the most common violations that most, and as we go through these, I'm also going to be telling you about a solution that addresses all of these issues for you, and that is Poster Guard Compliance Protection by G. Neal. Because of the complexity involved in keeping up with all the posters, the rate of change, and the severity of the penalties for noncompliance, We've developed a solution to help our customers stay on the right side of the law when it comes to posting compliance. Um, but before I get into all the specifics of posting compliance and the common mistakes, I realize that some of you attending today's webinar may not be familiar with Poster Guard, 
So I wanted to back up and give you a quick overview of the program and how it works. Poster Guard is a comprehensive labor law posting solution by GNEAL, and GNEAL is the industry leader in posting compliance for more than 25 years. And when we talk about our standard Poster Guard compliance protection service, we're referring to the posters that every business must display on their walls to comply with federal and state posting requirements. These are all the mandatory posters we went over at the beginning of the presentation. Um, the, the postings that are listed in the first column of the chart we reviewed, um, you know, up to 20 depending on your state. The way the service works is we start you out by sending all the mandatory and, uh, federal and state labor law postings to each of your locations. Um, and the posters, by the way, are combined and printed in a condensed laminated format. And this is to save wall space, but also for compliance reasons, um, you know, to ensure durability and to protect the posters from being ripped or torn or covered up. Um, once your locations get the initial postings, we take care of everything from there. Our in-house legal team monitors the posters daily for changes, and whenever there's a mandatory update, we automatically send you the new posters at no additional charge. And that is, uh, you know, no matter how many changes there are throughout the year. The changes, the updated poster just keeps coming automatically. Um, we also provide a customized members-only web portal where poster guard members can easily track all the changes and poster replacement activities for your specific locations. So you can see at a glance um, all of your active locations, which ones have poster changes, and you can even track shipments um, to see exactly where the poster is in transit, when it arrived, and who signed for it. Um, poster Guard also provides a 100% guarantee against government posting fines. This means that if you're a Poster Guard customer and you receive a government posting fine when you've properly displayed the most recent version of our posters, we take full responsibility for the fine. Um, something else worth mentioning to help further protect you against damages and lawsuits, we also provide complete record keeping. We maintain up to five years of records and uh, we provide our customers with all the evidence and data that they need to respond to requests in litigation or a government investigation, um, you know, to help prove that you are in compliance when it comes to all the posting laws applicable to your business. You know, it shows which locations had coverage, the time period, and the posters that were covered. Now let's jump into the common violations and what you need to be aware of to maintain 100% compliance with the uh, mandatory um, posting regulations. First of all, there are size, font, and color requirements that must be adhered to. Many of the posters have strict guidelines when it comes to the overall poster size, the layout of the poster, minimum font size, and there are even specific color requirements where you can't print certain posters in black and white. They have to be full color exactly according to agency specifications. All of this information, as I mentioned earlier, um, can actually be kind of difficult to find. It's not always on the website where you find the posters. So it's important to do your research to make sure you have it right. Um, this is something our legal team here at GNEAL takes very seriously and spends quite a bit of time on to make sure all of our posters comply with these requirements. Even if the requirements are buried in the underlying statutes or regulations apart from the um, poster images on the agency websites. Also, you should be aware that a lot of poster providers will try to cut corners to save on printing costs by shrinking the posters below the minimum compliance guidelines in order to fit all the federal and state postings on one sheet. Um, or they um, also we've seen uh, some providers that ignore the color requirements because um, printing in color costs more than in black and white. Um, so just also keep in mind that even if a particular poster doesn't have a, a minimum size or a minimum font requirement, it still has to be legible from a reasonable distance to be compliant. In other words, you can't shrink the font so small where employees have to get a magnifying glass to read it. Um, another common mistake um, is not complying with foreign language posting requirements. And this applies to everyone, even if all of your employees are proficient in English. This is something a lot of employers are not even aware of. But there are actually 22 states right now that require businesses to post certain postings in Spanish 
where you are required to post them in both English and Spanish regardless of your workforce demographics. So even if you don't have any Spanish speaking employees on your staff. In these 22 states, there are actually a total of 46 individual postings that have to be posted in English and Spanish. Um, a few states go even further and have requirements for other languages. We've seen up to 11 different languages, um, Russian, Japanese, Arabic, Mandarin, um, and Creole. Um, also, just a side note, in Puerto Rico, all of the postings have to be displayed in Spanish. That's uh, mandatory. This is the list of the 22 states that currently require postings to be displayed in Spanish. Like I said, even if you don't have any Spanish speaking employees. Um, the good news is <clears throat> if you're a poster guard member, these postings are already included in your regular English service. And I know this can be confusing because it is called the English service, but we believe in order to make sure you're entirely in compliance, if this is something that's required for all employers, then it should be included and not require any action on your part or, in our, um, you know, any decision making or any obligation for you to let us know that you need it. It's required, so it's automatically part of the service at no additional charge to make sure you're in 100% compliance. So if you're in any of these 22 states, there's really nothing to worry about when it comes to these postings if you have Poster Guard regular English service. Um, these posters already appear on your panel in both English and Spanish. Um, if you're not a Poster Guard member, you need to make sure you're obtaining these additional postings in Spanish and that you're posting them in both languages to maintain compliance. Um, if you want us to help you out and give you a complete list of the actual postings by name, please just send us a, um, an email or request it as a question and we'll follow up with you. Now, if you do have Spanish speaking employees, there are some additional requirements that you need to know about. So things change a little bit when it comes to your locations with a significant number of Spanish speaking employees. First of all, when it comes to the federal poster, the federal combination poster has six unique postings on it. Um, if you have a significant number of Spanish speaking employees who are not proficient in English, you need to post the federal combination poster in both English and Spanish. On a state level, there is not a requirement that's written into law that says you have to post or communicate every poster in both English and Spanish, even if you do employ a lot of Spanish speaking employees who are not proficient in English. However, most employers who have to post the bilingual federal poster because they do have Spanish speaking employees choose to go ahead and post all of the postings, the federal and state postings, as bilingual in both languages just because it's a best practice. It would just be difficult to explain in any kind of dispute why there was a choice made that certain posters were posted in Spanish but we didn't take the extra step to post all of the mandatory notices in the language that we know our employees would understand. So while it's not required and it's not in black and white in the law, it is recommended as a best practice if you're required to communicate the federal notices in Spanish to also communicate the state notices in Spanish as well. There is one exception and this is pretty recent. In Pennsylvania, employers who employ Spanish speaking employees do have to post all of the state posters in Spanish. Unfortunately, the agency doesn't provide a really clear definition of who this applies to. It simply says it applies to all employers with Spanish speaking employees in Pennsylvania. So it's not the same standard that I just mentioned for federal. It doesn't have to be a significant number and it doesn't even say that the employees have to not be proficient in English for this to apply. So to be safe, if you have Spanish speaking employees in Pennsylvania, you should be posting both the federal and state, all the posters in both English and Spanish. Um, so one of the things about Poster Guard is that it allows you the flexibility to decide for each of your locations. You can decide which ones need bilingual postings for federal, which ones need full bilingual for federal and state, and which ones are, uh, can be just covered by the regular English service. And this designation can be different from location to location. Now we're going to touch on e-verify posting requirements. 
First of all, what is E-Verify? E-Verify is an Internet-based system and it's operated by the government, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And it allows employers to check an employee's eligibility at the time of hire during the I-9 process. So through its database, it runs a cross-check with the DHS records and also the Social Security Administration's records to determine if an employee is eligible to work in the United States. The reason that we're talking about E-Verify in today's webinar is because any employer who participates in E-Verify has mandatory posting requirements. And um, this is something that many employers and poster providers overlook. This is a common mistake that you uh, need to be aware of when, um, to make sure that your posting display sites are complete. So who is required to participate in E-Verify? Um, this slide shows the list of states where employers are currently required to participate. These state laws are quickly evolving, and there are lots of other states right now with pending legislation to require E-Verify. Um, so um, as of today's date, when, as we're presenting this, this is the current list. I've also included an asterisk next to a few of the states. And this is because technically employers in those states are allowed to use an alternative um, to E-Verify, but the requirements are so similar that most employers choose to go ahead and use E-Verify. It's established, it works, and it just makes it easier to comply. So those are lumped in with the other mandatory E-Verify states. Also, regardless of your location, if you have federal government contracts, you're also required to participate in E-Verify. Um, federal agencies are also required to participate, and public sector employers, which are any government agency or government employer um, that, are, that operate in the states that are listed here, are also required to participate. So if you're in any of these categories, you're required to participate, and you're required to post the mandatory E-Verify postings. In addition, if you choose to voluntarily participate in E-Verify, then the posting requirement is also mandatory. So I know it seems counterintuitive, but it is a mandatory posting requirement even for voluntary participants. So what are the posting requirements for E-Verify participants? There are actually two notices that are required, the E-Verify participation poster and the right to work poster which a lot of people um, also call the E-Verify discrimination poster. Both of the posters have to be posted in English and Spanish, and that's true even if you have no Spanish-speaking employees. The posters have to be displayed where applicants and employees can see them. So most companies comply by posting these posters near an entrance. As a poster guard member, the E-Verify posters are automatically included in your basic service if it is a mandatory requirement because of your location. So in other words, if you're in any of those states where all employers have to participate, the E-Verify poster is already included in your service at no additional charge. The same thing goes if you're in any of the seven states where government employers have to participate. You're covered if you have poster guard for public sector. And that's a special version of Poster Guard that we offer um, for the public sector. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Finally, if you're a federal contractor and you have Poster Guard for federal contractors, which is another add-on service we provide for companies with government contracts, the E-Verify notices are automatically included with your service because they would be mandatory for you. Because the E-Verify posters are printed separately, a lot of poster providers leave them out to save costs. So if you're not a Poster Guard member, you need to make sure you're requesting these and posting them at all of your locations that participate. And remember, that's whether you're required to participate or doing it voluntarily. You, you need to make sure you have these up in areas where applicants can view them. Okay, um, similar to the E-Verify posters, there are other posters that need to be displayed separately um, apart from your general labor law displays, and these also get overlooked a lot. Um, a good example is with um, the no smoking posters. These are mandatory employee notices that must be posted in 31 states. And just like the other posters, there are specific posting guidelines to follow. That could include size, minimum size, minimum font, 
um, color requirements and um, specific guidelines for the posting locations, where, where to post them. And um, like E-Verify that we just went over, since these have to be printed separately, which is an added cost for printing, materials, and shipping, a lot of poster providers don't include them or they sell them separately. But um, cost aside, you need to know about these in order to request them to be in full compliance. As a poster guard customer, these are automatically included in your state kits at no additional charge because they are mandatory employee postings. Um, they are printed, we do provide them um, printed on separately on smaller panels so you can easily display them in the areas required by law, which is typically near an entrance. When we're talking about the no smoking posters, it's near an entrance in most cases. Um, and of course they comply with all the size, font, and color requirements as well. Also for your convenience, we also include posting instructions. So your location managers that are receiving the posters will know exactly what to do with them and why they're printed separately and, that they, and where to display them. They can actually scan their um, QR codes on the state posters. So they can actually scan the QR code and get immediate access to a web page with images of all the posters that need to be up on the wall um, and specific instructions about where to hang them, um, including the smaller individual posters, why they're printed separately and where they need to be um, hung. Um, next, this is a new trend we've been watching and most businesses have not caught up with the laws around city and county posting compliance. There are a lot of cities and counties that now require businesses to post additional employee notices. Um, this slide has a list of some of the bigger ones that have popped up over the last few years and a few of these have multiple postings that are required. Like Philadelphia has several mandatory postings and in San Francisco, I believe there are seven required city postings as of January 2015. The number of cities and counties requiring employers to post labor law notices is really growing quickly as cities are passing more and more ordinances giving employees certain rights and protections beyond what's already provided by federal or state law. So um, our legal team is monitoring and tracking these and this list is quickly growing. Almost daily, we're analyzing new legislation and ordinances that are coming out and determining whether they require mandatory postings and um, adding them to our offering. So we've actually just added another lawyer to our legal team just to focus on these city requirements because of the growth that we're seeing in this area. In terms of both the number of cities requiring posters and also the number of mandatory changes we're tracking for these posters. A lot of these posters change once or twice a year. Another common mistake is not posting your industry specific labor law notices. Um, there are a lot of industries that have additional posting requirements beyond the regular federal and state postings that all businesses must display. The ones that have the most, and um, we're just talking about employee facing notices here, not the kind of posters you would need for customers or patients or guests. Um, for employee facing posters, there are actually several additional posters required for public sector employers, employers that are in the healthcare industry, and employers in the restaurant industry. And these can be both federal and state postings. So we've developed full service posting solutions for these industries. I'm just going to go through some of the details um, quickly in case this section doesn't apply to you. Um, but um, for each of these um, additional services, um, they work just like the regular poster guard service where replacements are automatically sent when there's a change and they are also backed by our 100% compliance guarantee against um, government posting fines. Um, I did want to mention that there are also additional posting requirements for other industries, just not enough posters where they warrant a full service 50 state solution. But if you operate in certain types of businesses, um, it applies to hotels, airports, agriculture, transportation, courier services, adult entertainment, and there are a few more. Um, you, you might have additional obligations and we do have specialty posters that can help you comply. Um, just a couple words about poster guard for the public sector uh, and not to be confused with publicly traded companies. We're just talking about the public sector which are government employers. There are additional requirements. Actually, the federal poster is entirely different for public sector employers. It has a different version of the OSHA posting and the FLSA posting. 
Um, but on a state level, there are all sorts of additional posters that are required depending on your state. Um, examples are the E-Verify poster that we talked about, um, Right to Know posters, whistleblower protection posters, notices about electronic monitoring and privacy, and also there can be different smoking rules, different sm smoking posters. Poster guard for health care. Um, so in addition to your regular federal and state postings, if you're in health care, there are additional employee notices that are required and it could add up, it could be up to 15 additional notices depending on what state you're in and what type of facility you operate. Um, some typical examples are radiation notices. There are employee notices about patient rights and how to treat patients. There are special overtime rules for employees in healthcare and um, also special ethics and complaint procedures depending on your state. For restaurants, um, we also have a full service that's available as an add-on to your existing poster guard coverage. And these are um, additional posters. Again, they are employee-facing notices. And there are a number of additional posters required depending on your state. Um, some examples are um, choking, notices for tipped employees, CPR procedures, information about serving alcohol to minors. Um, and believe it or not, the posters from state to state on how to wash your hands are actually different and um, they are mandated by state law. Some of them have really specific um, guidelines in terms of the content, the color, the size, and the font. Now we're going to uh, talk about federal contractor posting requirements. And this isn't really an industry specific service because there are so many different types of businesses that may be covered by federal contractor posting requirements. Um, from financial institutions to car dealerships. Um, the specific posting obligations that you have depend on what active contracts you have and with what government agencies. Um, and in some cases, it also depends on the amount of the contracts or the amount of the sale for goods or services. Um, we've actually found that a lot of our customers and a lot of businesses with government contracts didn't even know they were required to post these additional notices. Um, this slide shows a list of the most common postings that are required for federal contractors. We won't go into detail on the specifics for each poster, um, but we do have a great white paper for, um, on this as well. It goes through each poster to help you determine what applies to you. So if you'd like that information, just send us an email or request it using the um, question feature and we'll be happy to, to um, get that out to you after the presentation. Just a quick word about the NLRA poster because we get a lot of questions about it and there's still some confusion around this one. For the NLRA poster, a lot of you probably heard over the past few years, there was a lot of buzz around a posting requirement that was part of a rule issued by the National Labor Relations Board um, and it required all employers to post this NLRA poster advising employees of their right to form a union. Um, this went through a lot of litigation and there was a lot of debate around it. And in the summer of 2013, there were a series of court cases that struck down this posting requirement and invalidated it. Um, but this requirement was the one that was going to apply to all employers. There is still a requirement and it's completely separate. It's part of Executive Order 13496 that applies to federal contractors and it requires federal contractors to post this NLRA poster. So federal contractors are not off the hook when it comes to this posting requirement. Um, these federal contractor posters change frequently, including new posters being created um, as well as posters that are updated with mandatory changes. Also, the penalties for noncompliance can be even worse than um, what we went over for the regular federal and state posters. If an employer doesn't comply with their federal contractor posting requirements, there are not only steep um, fines, but you can also lose your government contract or funding. Um, it's typically written right into the contract that the contract can be suspended or canceled just because of noncompliance with these posting requirements. Um, we realized that federal contractor posting compliance can be really complicated, especially keeping track of all the government contracts you have um, you know, what contracts are active at what time, their total value, and then how that corresponds with what posters have to be displayed, especially because in most uh, businesses, your federal contracts come and go. 
And that means your posting obligations are constantly changing too. Also, in most businesses, the person responsible for posting compliance isn't the same person who's responsible for managing all of the government contracts. So it's, um, there's a potential for things to fall through the cracks there. So we listened to our customers on this issue and um, recently developed an all-in-one solution to make this as easy as possible. It's a full service solution. It works just like the um, regular poster guard service. Um, and it can be added as an, you know, an add-on service to poster guard federal and state. But um, it covers all of the federal contractor posting requirements. Um, and just like Poster Guard, all the updates and replacements are covered automatically, and it's backed by the um, compliance guarantee against posting fines. Um, this one, by the way, is offered in English and Spanish, and it is required in Spanish if you have a significant portion of employees who speak Spanish. It's not required for everyone in English and Spanish. Um, another common violation is failing to post in proper locations throughout your business. All of the posting statutes have their own specific language about where to post. But the general rule is that the posters have to be displayed in prominent and conspicuous locations throughout your business where they are accessible to all employees. So in a small office, you might be able to satisfy this requirement by posting in one location, like an employee break room, um, if you know that all your employees have access to it and use it regularly. In most cases, though, you're going to need more than one posting display site to make sure all of your employees have regular access to the posters. The number of posting display sites you'll have in each facility really just depends on the logistics of your facility and how accessible the posters are to your employees. Um, to ensure compliance, you want to look for you know, highly visible areas or high traffic areas um, that you know, your employees frequent. So in a large facility, this could mean posting near each employee entrance as well as the employee break room or um, if you have an employee locker room, that's, uh, that's always a good place to post. If you have an HR department, you also want to consider posting near the HR offices where you have other em employee information. Um, another idea is to hang them near time clock stations. If you, do, if you have employees that, who physically punch a time clock and you have a lot of hourly workers. Um, you also need to be aware of applicant area posting requirements. Um, and we're going to go over that in more detail in just a moment. So it really just depends on the layout of your facility. Um, unfortunately, there's no magic number or formula provided by the regulations or the agencies. I've had some clients in high-rise buildings who have needed to post on every floor because there wasn't a main entrance that all the employees shared. Um, so it's really specific to your facility, but you need to think of all your affected employees and make sure you have the posters in areas where they frequent. Um, now we're just going to touch briefly on applicant area postings. This is an area of compliance that a lot of people are just not that familiar with, and it's really important because with an auditor or an inspection officer that comes in, they really don't have to go that far to see if you're in compliance. Um, a lot of employers don't realize, but um, out of the six mandatory federal postings that we went over, four of them have to be displayed in an area where applicants can view them. And um, those are the EEOC, SMLA, USERA, and EPPA postings. Those four have to be displayed for applicants. Um, we've developed two different solutions, and these can be added onto your regular poster card service. Um, the first is sort of a vinyl adhesive sticker, and this is, um, it's more compact. It um, just has the four mandatory postings, and it's perfect for those little applicant kiosks with computers, you know, at the desks, or other small areas. If there's a dedicated applicant area, uh, or like I said, a desk where you have employees sit to fill out their application, um, you know, it could stick to the desk or to the little cubicle wall. Um, then we have another option, which is a little bit larger and more comprehensive. It's a laminated poster with the four mandatory postings. And then by customer request, we've added two additional uh, best practice notices. One informs applicants that you comply with immigration laws and I-9 requirements, and the other notifies applicants that you are a drug-free workplace. Um, and this, is, this option is ideal for companies that have a dedicated applicant area or an interview room where they have you know, the wall space to, to put up a full poster. 
Um, finally, we have failing to meet posting obligations for remote workers as a common mistake. This is an area of getting more and more attention because of the trend toward employing telecommuters. Um, for years here at GNEAL, the legal team has gotten questions from our customers saying they have employees who work from home and you know, they wanted to know what they are supposed to do in terms of the posters. Should they be sending their home-based employee full-size laminated posters? We have gotten that question um, over and over. And um, we have all kind of laughed trying to imagine someone working from home putting up full-size laminated posters in their kitchen or on their bathroom walls. And um, obviously that wouldn't work and that is not required. But it is kind of confusing by, because by law, you are required to provide the mandatory federal and state notices to all of your employees. However, the regulations don't tell us exactly how that is supposed to be done when it comes to your home-based employees. They do tell you that you are required to communicate the information, but they don't tell you that you have to use a certain solution or format and whether it has to be paper or electronic. Um, but there are some recent opinion letters and also some court cases where employers have sent the notices to home-based workers or um, telecommuters or off-site remote workers electronically. And the courts have said that is a good alternative and that makes sense. The important thing is that you've got the notices to them and that's what counts. So to help our customers comply, we've developed PosterGuard e-service for remote workers. And this is really, um, it's not a substitute for wall postings if you have a facility where people report to work. But uh, for your off-site employees, for employees who have Internet access and who either they have computers or mobile devices where they regularly access email, it is a fully compliant solution. This is the way the Poster Guard e-service for remote workers works. Um, you provide the email addresses to us of your remote workers and we pretty much take it from there to communicate everything and keep you in compliance. Once we have the email address, we send a welcome email to the off-site employee and the email has simple instructions requiring the employee to download, view the posters, and then to acknowledge the date and time the posters were viewed. And all of the images are hosted by us in our environment and the legal team you know, keeps them current and accurate. Um, this um, email communication goes out right when the employee is um, enrolled or signed up. Um, and then again, whenever there is a mandatory change, we automatically send another email with the same instructions, letting the employee know the posters have changed and they are required to um, you know, click to view the posters and acknowledge that they have done so. So um, this is really great because it provides full tracking of all the dates and times when your employees acknowledge the posters. It actually shows up on PosterGuard.com, the members only um, web, web portal, with all your other shipping and delivery information. So just like that, as you can see when a package arrives at your location, you know, when a um, posting kit arrives, you can also see an employee's name and the date and time when the employee viewed and acknowledged the electronic posters. This is really useful. I can tell you from experience and um, it's usually with employee handbook policies. But employees will always say when there's a dispute, I didn't know about that rule or I didn't get that memo or you know, I didn't see the update. So in this case you have the proof and the tracking for backup showing that the employee did in fact view and acknowledge all the postings as required. Well that wraps it up. I hope you found this presentation to be helpful and informative. I know we went over a lot of legal requirements and details, but there's a lot to share when it comes to these laws and the risks of noncompliance. If you have any questions or would like additional information about PostRegard or any of the compliance issues I've talked about today, please feel free to contact our compliance specialist, Peter Frey, at 954-970-5702. Or you can reach Peter by email at pfrey, P-F-R-A-Y, at hrdirect.com. Thanks again for attending today's presentation and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.